Hi there, and welcome to our webinar, Safety First, Common and Hidden Dangers for Pet Birds uh, with Dr. Stephanie Lamb. Um, let's see, we have a couple moments here. Let's let people log in. This is gonna be a very informative and important um, webinar for today. And yesterday was, was yesterday, anybody know? Anybody know? It was National Pet Bird Day. So um, dogs get their days, cat gets their days, and pet birds get their day. So yesterday, September 17th was National Pet Bird Day. Uh, we had a really cute video. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Live Fever has its own YouTube channel. So uh, you should go on definitely and subscribe because um, we've got some really informative uh, videos up there for you. And I am going to, let me try this. I'm gonna try sharing a screen of the video we have up from yesterday, because it's really cute. Let's see. Uh, Can you see that? Oops. Ah! I gotta recycle it. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. That is, look at these conures. I mean, they really want their nutri berries. Um, so, you got, uh, wait, wait for the second guy to come in. Here we go, here we go. He's got a sibling or a flock mate. Where'd he go? Um, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. There he is. But, um, this is kind of show how, how clever and uh, ingenious birds are when, uh, especially when food is involved. Um, so they're thoroughly enjoying those niche berries. I have a hard time opening containers like that. So I'm actually very impressed that they can do that. <laughs> so anyways, all right. That was it uh, yesterday, National Pet Bird Day. But you know what? You can celebrate, have National Pet Bird Day every day, you know, so. Uh, there we go. Uh, so uh, log on. So check out our YouTube channel. That was a snippet of some things you'll find on there. Um, and today, today we've got a very important topic. I think we'll get everything started. Hopefully, everyone is logged on and ready to go. Um, so okay. So we're going to talk about safety first. Uh, Dr. Lamb, uh, let's. Oh, sorry. Real quick. If you have any questions, uh, make sure you use the Q and A button, not the chat feature, because we can uh, capture your question if we don't get to it and send you. An uh, response later at a later time. So with that said, um, remember to use the Q&A button if you have a question and I'm gonna let Dr. Lamb take a look. All right, awesome. Thanks for having me back again. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about just uh, common uh, dangers uh, for pet birds. And so uh, there's lots and lots of things out there. I'm, I'm not gonna probably be able to hit on all the different things that could go wrong. Um, because that's just how life is. I mean, anything can, can come up and be a problem at, at some point. Uh, but I wanted to hit on the real common things that I get to see here as a veterinarian. Um, you know, there are more frequent things that we see animals coming in for uh, injuries or problems that occurred at home um, that potentially could have been avoided. Uh, and so the, my hope and goal for today is that um, you guys come away from this having a little bit better idea of things that could go wrong so that you can hopefully avoid those things from going wrong at home. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have some uh, photos for us to all have a look at. All right, can you see that okay there? Yep. Awesome. All right, um, so the, the issues that I wanted to touch on today are sort of outlined here. Um, injuries that occur when we have a bird versus another bird in the home, uh, bird versus other animals in the home, and problems that can occur with other species that people may commonly keep as pets. Um, problems that birds can encounter with people that are accidents. Um, problems that I have seen with birds in their cages versus their toys and also just standard things in the household that we should be aware of to try to avoid any problems. So starting off with uh, bird versus bird injuries and, and problems that we can see. If you look down at the lower uh, left hand corner of the screen there, it's a real cute picture. This is in a lorikeet exhibit that a lot of zoos um, and uh, 
aviaries and uh, animal feature places have because they're really fun. Um, lorikeets, as I'm sure many people know, are really high energy, fun birds that um, are like little clowns. And um, what's great about having them in these aviaries is people can go in there and, and feed them. They'll come down, they'll land on you, and you can have a great, wonderful experience uh, like I have in these pictures here. And if you look at the picture at the left, you can see all these birds are eating together and we kind of see an environment where they look relatively um, content, happy, no overt signs of any sort of stress or problems between them living together. And that's what we kind of hope for in our homes, is that we hope for our birds to live harmonious lives together. A lot of people who have birds don't have just one. A lot of people who have birds have multiple birds. And so we all hope that our birds are going to get along together great and be able to live in this sort of flock-like situation. Um, but the reality is, is not all birds get along with other birds, just like not all people get along with other people. Um, you know, they have very diverse personalities, um, different wants and needs, just like people do. And so sometimes things can clash. And um, if you look at the picture on the right, if you look at the lower right hand corner and you see those two lorikeets there. So I'm doing the exact same thing of just feeding these birds in this aviary. But if you look at them, they're actually not getting along very well. Um, you can see that they both have their beaks open um, as sort of a warning like, hey, don't come any closer. If you do, I might bite you. And the one to the far right there, you can actually see his little foot is up. And I'll kind of try to outline that with my uh, pointer here. But he's kind of leaning back. His sort of wings are out, like he's getting ready to possibly fly. But he's going to kick his friend away first. Um, so, you know, it's a very subtle thing, you know, when this picture was being taken here I am just smiling and being really excited to be hanging out with birds and having the one on my head I was you know uh, not aware of what was actually going on in the situation here um, and afterwards when I looked at the pictures that's when I saw that oh you know these two individuals weren't exactly getting along at that moment in time now um, that's another point that I want to make is that, you know, you may have two individuals who can get along really great. And, you know, I don't know the two different pictures that I have here, which birds are actually which. These two birds that are in the lower left hand corner that are eating right next to each other, they could be the same birds that are in this picture here. I really don't know. Um, where in one picture you see them doing fine, another picture you see them not doing fine. Um, and that's because animals get into momentary arguments or disagreements about things. I'm sure, you know, this resource of this delicious apple that I have in my hand that I was feeding them is really, um, you know, one of them wanted it and didn't want the other one around. He was guarding it. Um, and so in some cases where these birds may get along great and do really fine, some circumstances may come up sometimes that, you um, make them act differently and they could potentially get into arguments um, and not be so nice to one another. So um, in these next photos here, these are a couple of African greys um, and these are actually both my African greys. Um, and if you look at these photos, neither of them look happy in these photos. I, I snapped the photos real quick and then separated them. Um, I have two African greys and a lot of people think like, oh, you should be able to have two of the same species in the same household and they can get along great. Um, and one thing I have a lot of owners often ask me when they have a feather plucker is, hey, I have a feather plucker. I think this bird's lonely. Um, could I potentially get it a friend and maybe it'll stop plucking itself or, you know, maybe it can be happier and more content. Well, if you look at this photo here, um, one of these greys is a feather plucker um, and she was the first gray that I had in my house. Um, and she, when we brought the second gray into the home, not that we got the second gray with the intention of um, stopping her from plucking, but you can see it didn't actually do anything uh, to stop her plucking. She continued to pluck. Um, it didn't stop that behavior. Uh, she, I don't think, really cared so much for the other gray coming into the home. And both of them made that very clear uh, pretty early on that they didn't 
really want to be around one another. And when they do get close to each other, um, as they got together in these pictures momentarily, um, <laughs> they, they can get into arguments and fights. And so I have to be extremely cautious if I have them out at the same time to be aware of where they are and, and what they're doing. Um, so a lot of times we think that birds can live together in this sort of harmonious environment. And if they're the same species, they're going to get along. It's going to be great. But that's just not the case. Um, sometimes they will. Sometimes you can have two birds that are bonded great and have really wonderful lives together. And sometimes they can be different species and do really wonderful. But a lot of times they don't. Um, a lot of times these our pet birds um, have really been socialized with people. And um, sometimes become more bonded to people and really care less about other birds. And so um, having two birds in the home, if they're, you know, really not uh, bonded pairs, you have to be cautious of them interacting with one another because they can hurt each other. And one of the most common injuries that I see when here in uh, veterinary practice, when birds do get into fights with one another, is injuries to the beak and injuries to the toes. Those are the two most common locations where birds will have injuries occur. And so I have a couple of pictures on the next slide. Um, this military macaw on the left there, uh, you can see she's got a little bandage on her um, left foot. And that bandage is covering up a nasty wound that she got from another macaw in her house. Um, and unfortunately, that wound was so severe, it damaged the blood supply um, so that the tip of the digit uh, couldn't heal appropriately and she had to have an amputation of that digit. Um, so, you know, it's it's a, a common spot and not, not all birds have to have amputations or anything like that when these injuries occur to the toes, um, but that's kind of the most extreme that, that this bird ended up losing a digit because of another bird in the home. Um, and they're both macaws. They were different species of macaws, but they're both macaws. And uh, sometimes, you know, we think that they should get along, but they don't always. Um, this other photo here, this little bird um, lost his, his beak. Uh, another bird grabbed it and, and unfortunately uh, was quite strong and was able to tear that top beak off. Um, and that injury is not going to heal the same way that it was before. Um, that injury can heal. That bird can go on to live a um, okay life, but it's never going to have the same beak that it had before. It's basically going to be left with a stump. Um, and so they often end up having to have uh, food supplied to them in a different way. They have to have foods moistened or softened in some way. Some of them are very ingenious though and um, will still be able to like crack a seed or something hard on sort of the edge of the beak or I've even seen some birds who have been able to um, learn how to take a seed or a nut or something and uh, sort of wedge it between the lower beak. It's usually the upper beak that gets injured most commonly um, and like a cage bar and be able to still crack something. So a lot of birds are very adaptive and, and uh, can be able to do well, but you know this sort of injury is, is quite dramatic and, and very painful for, for a bird. Um, another photo I have here is of a green cheek conure um, that had its beak bit by a larger bird. I don't remember the exact species it was that bit the bird, but it was a larger species. Um, and what happened, this photos, they're showing two different angles of the bird. When the bird had the injury occur, um, it fractured on the left side of the beak, like kind of right down in this corner. And the bird, the one who caused the injury, um, peeled the beak sort of back to the side. So it actually got bent, and you can see it along the right um, side of the beak there, kind of at the junction between the beak and the side of the sear and the skin. Um, it actually bent it over to the side. 
Um, so we were able to, we got to this bird right away. The owners um, came to us rather quickly and we were able to sort of push this side back into alignment. Um, and this stuff that's on the top was a little resin that we had used um, to sort of, sort of coat it and seal it. Um, and this actually is multiple weeks after the injury occurred, there was actually some resin holding a piece of the beak together here, but it lost this whole chunk on the side of its beak. Now, I would consider this bird actually lucky because this bird still has um, half of its beak to be functional with. Um, but what's going to happen is this bird's always going to need to have beak trims in the long run. And you can kind of see this lower beak, how long it's actually getting, because it should really be stopping maybe right about there as it grinds down against the upper beak. Um, so this bird long-term needs, needs beak trims, but he still has half of his beak to be functioning appropriately and being able to um, crack his food and, and he doesn't have to have his food softened. Um, so, you know, these bird versus bird injuries, um, again, they, they can be quite dramatic, quite uncomfortable, um, and they're often localized either on the beak or the toes. There's the most common spot that I'm seeing them. And when you think about it, if a bird is biting in another location, um, there's feathers in the way. So sometimes they're just grasping at those feathers. Maybe those feathers get pulled, the other one is able to get away. Um, but areas that are exposed that don't have feathers, the beak and the toes, um, can sustain much more serious injuries to them. Um, so, uh, and then this this bird actually is an example of a green cheek conure um, that got bit um, by also a larger bird. And it may be a little bit difficult to tell, but you can kind of see how his eyes are a little sunken here. It, what happened is, is, is the bird actually got bit on the top of the head um, and had it, both of its eyes punctured. Um, and it was just one quick bite. Um, and I would also sort of consider this bird slightly lucky because if that African gray chomped down harder, I mean, that bird could have, could have killed this bird. Um, unfortunately, the, the gray left the conure uh, blinded um, in the long run but uh, he's still alive. So, you know, it's sometimes, you know, more serious injuries can happen. I, I have seen birds where a larger bird has killed a, a smaller bird, you know, so um, it's something to be very, very mindful of and aware of that you have to watch your birds interacting together because um, some real serious injuries can happen if you're not mindful of the interactions that they have together. Um, and if there's anything where you have seen any sort of little stress or, or bickering between individuals, then you know it might be it might be best to really just keep those individuals separate. So Dr. Lamb, um, yeah. just a quick question. Uh, some of these injuries just from over the years that I've heard of and I've actually experienced myself is uh, another bird that's out of the cage flies over to a bird that's in the cage and can pinch a beak or a foot through the cage bars. So yes. um, not necessarily, they're not necessarily out together, just if one, you know, and they can be territorial around the cage. So you can have an injury occur, one bird flying onto another bird's cage, right? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, and and I've, I've definitely had um, cases like that where, yeah, one bird crawls across the top of another bird's cage and um, the bird in the cage is not happy about somebody coming near their cage because that's their territory, that's their location. Like, why are you coming by my house? Are you gonna steal my you know, fun toys or my food? What's going on? I don't want you around here. So, you know, they climb up and bite those toes. Um, so it's, you know, yeah, even, even when they, one is caged, be aware of where um, your birds are because you don't want to uh, have any troubles. <laughs> so, um, okay, so to go into sort of the next area is um, birds and, and other animals. You know, a, a lot of people who have birds, 
animal people. You know, I, I personally have other species. Um, I don't just have, have birds. Um, a lot of people will have, you know, a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a ferret or, you know, uh, some something else. Um, and while some species may be um, uh, unlikely to be a problem, um, you never no. Um, and I'll, I'll give a story once uh, that happened to me once. Uh, the, um, you wouldn't think that a bird and a fish would necessarily have a problem together. Um, but I had a little zebra finch um, and I had a fish tank. I had a 20 gallon fish tank. Um, and my zebra finch was out with me one time. He was hand tamed. So he was a very, very like people friendly little bird. And um, I was cleaning my fish tank and he hopped over onto the edge of the fish tank while I was cleaning it um, and looking at what I was doing. And then he just jumped in to the fish tank and it was a 20 gallon fish tank. I mean, I was right there. And so I just scooped him right out. Um, but had I have not been right there and he, for whatever reason, decided to jump into my fish tank because he he, he probably, I, I can only imagine what's going through his mind, but um, I would assume that maybe he saw, oh, a body of water, it's probably shallow. I could go jump in here and take a bath because I would give him like little shallow dishes to bathe in. He probably just didn't understand that it wasn't shallow. Uh, but yeah, you know, if I wouldn't have been right there, he could have drowned. Um, and it's a fish tank, you know? So, so again, just being mindful and aware of the, the, dangers and, and risks that are out there with our different pets. Um, so I put this, this photo up here of a bird and a dog. Uh, um, it's not a real dog, it's a stuffed dog. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of people have dogs. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, I, I had dogs with, with birds. Um, and I don't think it's wrong to have dogs and birds in the same household. Um, and I know some people who are very adamant that if you have a bird, you should not have a dog. Um, and I, I don't think that that's the case. But what I do think is the case is I think you have to be extremely mindful of your bird around your dog. Um, dogs are predators. Even though they're loving animals in our homes and they're great companions um, and they're man's best friend, um, we, we have to recognize that um, they are predators still. And so, um, you know, predator instincts can come out sometimes when you don't expect them. Even in the smallest dogs, you know, a lot of people will sometimes be worried about certain breeds being a problem over others. Um, and where there might be some validity to that with like birding dogs who are uh, bred to be more interested in birds because of hunting. Um, I will, I have to say that I have not, when I've seen bird versus dog injuries, I have never seen a, a or had not recognized a breed predilection. I've seen large dogs and I've seen the real tiny dogs um, go after birds. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter the breed of dog that you have. Um, what matters is that you have to recognize that a dog is a predator to a bird and you have to be cautious and mindful of um, them interacting together and being around one another. Um, so just a, a couple of photos of some birds that um, I have personally known um, with unfortunate interactions with, with dogs. Um, the African gray on the left side of the screen there, that is Sadie. Um, you can see that she's actually got a little stub for one of her, her feet on her left foot there. Um, and that's because unfortunately a dog um, took her foot off. Um, it also damaged her other foot as well. It's hard to tell in this photo, but she is missing one of the digits on her right foot. And you can kind of see she stands a little awkwardly on that foot as well. Um, and that's because of the injuries that she sustained uh, after a, a dog attack. She healed, her life was good. You know, she, she um, had loving owners um, and the injury, at the time that this picture was taken, this picture was taken like years after injury from the dog. Um, 
So she lived a fine life, but you know, now she's handicapped in, in certain ways and, and needs to have different uh, perches and slightly different cage set up um, to be able to live as normal of life as possible. Um, and if anybody's interested, the, the breed of dog for her that got her was a, um, it was a German Shepherd, so a larger breed. Now, as opposed to the Eclectus here, um, this little Eclectus came in um, and he doesn't have anything visibly abnormal on this photo from the injury that can be seen. Um, underneath the, the wing is where he had just a small puncture. Um, he was attacked by a Chihuahua. So from a very large breed to a very small breed, um, it, it doesn't matter, you know, that any, any dog uh, can go after a after a bird. And um, I don't know the case of the interaction with the uh, German Shepherd and the African Grey as to how well they knew each other, but I can tell you with the Eclectus and the Chihuahua, they knew each other fine. Um, they had lived in the same household, I think, for like six years or something like that. Then, and um, the, the um, interactions between them had, according to the owner, always been pretty good. Now, the other thing I want to say is um, the eclectus. You know, a lot of times we think, okay, if the bird is injured, um, it's the dog's fault. And, you know, yes, the dog may have caused the injury, but birds can play a role in, in uh, the situation being a problem as well. The eclectus actually had cornered the chihuahua uh, in a hallway. So the eclectus was out, the chihuahua was out, you know, to both of them thinking that this is my home and I have free roam of it. Um, and the Eclectus went after the Chihuahua, cornered it in a hallway. The Chihuahua felt, I'm sure, like it had nothing else that it could do. So it jumped at, at the bird and, and bit the bird. Um, so, you know, when, when animals are in situations that they're scared or uncomfortable, then they may act in totally different ways than, um, if they're not scared or uncomfortable. So, you know, I feel like we can't blame the Chihuahua too much in that interaction because he was just scared, you know, and then it kind of comes down more to us, you know, the owners um, as, as the ones who maybe sometimes more to blame for, for these uh, unfortunate circumstances because, you know, a, a pet bird um, that we've, you know, taken from the wild and we've bred it in captivity and we're having it live these, this life with us, um, it's a very different life from what they would be living in the wild. Um, and so it's our responsibility to be aware of what's going on in the situations that we're putting them in um, to keep them as safe as possible. Um, this is an example of a bird who unfortunately lost his wing after an encounter with a raccoon. Um, this bird was housed in an outdoor aviary, um, and raccoons are very smart, um, and very mischievous, um, and this bird, the owners, all the owners know is that they woke up in the morning time, they went outside, and the bird was injured. Um, so he, presumably, um, they knew that there was a raccoon around, so we are assuming that it was a raccoon attack. And, and given the injury and its appearance, I would highly suspect that that was in fact the case um, because raccoons, sometimes when they're grabbing things, they'll reach between cage bars. They have very dexterous hands um, and can reach in and grab something and, and pull it towards them. And you couldn't get the whole bird out from the cage because the cage bars were um, you know, narrow enough that he couldn't get the bird out, but he was able to get, um, pretty substantial injury uh, caused to this bird and, and the bird ended up having to have an amputation um, of the wing because it was just so damaged. Um, so, uh, you know, this bird is, um, ended up going to live with um, one of the technicians that I worked with and, and he lives a pretty great life. He's a happy bird, but you know, now he, he'll never fly again uh, since he only has his, his one wing for him. So, um, you know, nobody owns that raccoon that's outside, but again, if, if you're having uh, an animal outdoors, um, you know, making sure that caging is really appropriate, secure, and safe for any individuals that are living um, in outdoor aviaries. Even if they're not sleeping in those aviaries overnight, um, it's important that 
they be very secure because if a bird is left alone for any length of time inside of an aviary, um, you know, any uh, wild animal or, you know, feral cat could potentially come around and cause some problems. Uh, speaking of cats, um, here is a photo of a cockatiel that kind of got its little bottom chewed on um, by a cat. And so, you know, cats have smaller mouths. Maybe they don't do as sometimes severe of damage for, for birds as some of um, like the, the um, other images that I was showing where birds were losing a limb or um, what have you. Uh, but the real, one of the real big problems with um, bites from cats in particular, though problematic for other uh, animals as well, is, you know, there's a lot of bacteria in their mouths. And when a cat bites an animal, a bird, or anything else, um, it's basically getting a little bit of bacteria sort of inoculated into that wound where they bit. And um, you may have an injury that's not too bad. This cockatiel, I think, you know, it clearly got chewed on. I, I would not want to have a part of me looking like that. Um, so this little, this little cockatiel sustained a bit more of an injury, but sometimes people will, will call and say, hey, do I really need to bring my bird into the hospital? Um, it, you know, my cat got it. All I see is a little scrape, but it otherwise looks fine. Um, my recommendation is always yes, it probably really should come in because of the bacteria. Um, we know that saliva uh, from cat bites with that bacteria, um, if it gets into wounds, a, a bird can die within 24 to 72 hours of an injury like that. So even if it seems like it's a real minor thing, um, it really should be being seen. Um, and if you look at this photo of this gray going up to this cat, um, that gray, if you're reading the, that bird's body language, that bird is, is being very ag aggressive towards that cat. That bird is saying, hey, this is my tree stand area. You need to move off. Um, but if a bad interaction happens between these two animals, um, it's probably going to be the cat that is going to be the winner of any sort of fight that happens between the two of them. Even though the bird may be starting the fight, uh, just like we saw with the eclectus, um, you know, they may not really win those fights that they start. And, and they don't know that. They just think that they're, you know, again, guarding some sort of resource. Um, that bird likes its, its uh, tree stand. It doesn't want the cat on it. It's telling the cat to go away. But, you know, if that cat turns around and swats at that bird, that could be a real problem. So, you know, being aware with when you have cats in the house, um, just where are they? What are they doing? Be cautious of having the cat and the bird out at the same time. Um, just being hyper vigilant. Okay, so now to uh, get on to um, when accidents happen between birds and, and people. Um, so this photo here of this military macaw, um, you can see in the picture to the left where it's uh, standing on the edge of the, the um, table there that its foot is really torqued to the side. Um, and then in the other picture, it's actually under anesthesia in, in that photo. Um, you can see that the foot is completely flipped backwards. Um, and that's because that bird got sat on by its owner. Uh, you know, the owner, it was an accident. Uh, the owner had the bird out, I guess, just didn't really know exactly where it was at the time, um, and unfortunately sat on the bird. Um, I guess good news for this bird is it was a large bird, because if this was like a cockatiel or a budgie that got sat on, um, you know, humans are quite large compared to birds. Um, and that could potentially result in, in death of a bird. And I will say I have unfortunately experienced that before um, and had that story happen with a patient. So um, this bird broke its leg from that interaction, uh, but was able to have its leg fixed. You know, this, this bird, it was able to have uh, that like set appropriately and it, and it healed fine. Um, but again, very painful situation for this bird to be in. So if your birds are out, be very 
mindful of where they actually are in your house. Um, they often want to be around us and they may be, if we have a bird that wings are clipped and it's not flighted, um, it may crawl on the ground and be right up next to your feet and you turn around and step on it on accident. So, so you know, it's something that um, we need to be cautious as well. The, the other unfortunate um, story I have had heard or have heard happen a few times is birds and doors. Um, birds sometimes like to hang out on ledges of, of doors. If a door is open, they may hang out on the top of that door because, hey, that's a great vantage point to be sitting up on top of that door and, you know, surveying what's going on in a room. Um, and if people don't know that they're up there, um, I've had birds come in here with toes uh, broken from, you know, they moved too late to get off that door when the owner closed the door. And, and I've also had birds come in here that unfortunately, you know, got crushed in a door um, and didn't make it. So, you know, if you have your bird out, just be aware of where your bird is, whether it's on the floor, up around somewhere, just, you know, take note of where your bird is hanging out so that you are not having any unfortunate accidents occur. Um, oh, this, this is an x-ray and it's really blown up. So just to sort of orient you guys um, to see this x-ray, uh, this bone here is the femur bone. This is on a Quaker parrot. Um, this is the tibiotarsus bone and this sort of junction here between these two portions is not supposed to be there. Um, this is a fracture of the tibiotarsal bone. And this is, this x-ray is actually already a few weeks into this bird healing. It's actually getting some callus, so you can kind of see a little bone sort of fusing together. But a fracture happened on this bird's like, and also this portion is not supposed to be up here. It should be down right like underneath the femur. Um, this bird was flying, um, and I don't recall the, the exact reason why, but the owner had, for some reason, needed to get the bird quickly, reached up into the air and grabbed the bird, um, and unfortunately was just a little too forceful, again, an accident, but unfortunately just a little too forceful when grabbing the bird and caused a dislocation of the knee and a fracture further down of the tibiotarsis of, of this bird. So. Um, this bird had a couple of injuries. Again, it was a complete accident, but um, you know, we're big, they're little, um, and injuries can happen sometimes when uh, we are trying to work quickly around them. Um, the other thing that I've had happen commonly too as an accident, um, or seen commonly happen, uh, that I don't have any pictures of, is if a bird bites a person and they weren't expecting it, um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, if we're getting injured, our, our instinct, just as it is for any other animal's instinct, is to get away um, from something that is harming us. Um, and I've unfortunately seen a few times where people have flung birds, like a bird bit somebody on the hand and they just flung their hand to like let the bird go because they were in sudden uh, discomfort um, and had I've had birds come in with fractured wings or legs because the bird got flung off of, of uh, a person's hand and um, hit something and, and got injured. So again, it's an accident. People don't mean for it to, to happen, of course. I've never had anybody come in here saying that um, you know, they, they threw their bird on purpose, um, but just something to, to be aware of. You know, um, A lot of those situations where that has happened, it's been where people have been doing something to the bird where the bird maybe got a little nervous and it's, it's typically been things um, like they were getting their toenails trimmed or wings trimmed or something like that at home um, and uh, had an accident occur. There's been other situations too, but usually that bird is nervous for some reason um, and you can slightly predict that it would have happened because something scary was happening to the bird that made that bird bite and then the person you know, reacted um, in with just their instincts. So, um, okay, so moving along a little bit here. Uh, so birds versus a cage. So this 
photo here. Nothing bad actually happened in this photo, uh, but you can see how this could potentially turn into something bad. Uh, this African Grey, that is mine, um, she broke one of the bars of her cage. Uh, this is a travel cage, uh, and I guess she had been working on it for a little while and I didn't realize it. And uh, she broke one of the bars and got her head out through that little bar. Um, I recognized it pretty quickly and we changed that. Um, but you could see how if I wouldn't have recognized that there that that was broken, uh, if I wasn't around and she was in that travel cage, what if she attempted to come out and, uh, you know, or, or what if, because this is, you can kind of see it's in a car. Uh, what if I had another animal in the car? Like what if my dog was with me and, and the bird sticks its head through the bars? And you know, I mean, there's just so many potential for, for problems here. Um, you know, looking at your cage, making sure that your cage is appropriately intact, that your bird has not damaged portions of the cage. Um, to be able to escape or get a foot stuck somewhere that they shouldn't, a wing stuck somewhere that they shouldn't, um, is really kind of a, a good thing to come in a habit of, like maybe, you know, when you're cleaning your bird's cage, maybe make a habit of just checking the corners and everything, just make sure that there's no potential problems uh, that could, could arise with the cage. That reminds me, uh, my cockatiel, I had his cage on a countertop with the window and I didn't realize this until, I don't know, he was probably had a good square inch hole in the screen behind his cage. He had been excavating the, you know, chop, chipping away at the screen and uh -huh. he could have fit his head out. You know, he could have flown out the screen out into the wild without yeah. getting chipped away at the screen. Yeah. So. Yeah. And they, can sometimes, they can sometimes do those things really quickly too. You know, I mean, those beaks are powerful. Um, I don't think I put a picture of it in this, in this um, PowerPoint. But um, I had a cockatoo patient one time that I was, uh, it was he was a foster uh, that I was transporting. And we had a long car ride. We had like a two hour car ride. And I had him in a standard like cat plastic carrier. And um, that has like the little holes on the side that they can kind of see through. Oh my gosh. Um, he just sat there and broke the hole. He broke the plastic, totally opened it up, completely got out of the carrier on our car ride. It was only a two hour car ride. It was a, like a new carrier. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that was an inappropriate carrier for that bird is a lesson to be learned there. You've got a big, strong beak, um, have an appropriate cage that will make it so a bird can't get through that carrier. Um, now, the reason I have this photo up, um, this was just an example of a, of a bird versus a cage injury that happened. Um, this little African gray, she uh, got injured by her cage door. The cage, she was like sitting on the side of the cage door. The owner was like going to close it. He thought she was like getting in, but she was starting to come out and he tried to close it quickly. And unfortunately, her leg got stuck in the cage door and it fractured. Um, and the photos that I'm showing here are just different stages of um, that fracture. So uh, initially, this is one x-ray that a couple of weeks into trying to get this to heal, we tried to get it to heal initially with a bandage, uh, but you can see this is that same bone that was broken on the other x-ray. This is the tibiotarsal bone, um, and you can see it's just sort of severed right there. Here's the other side for a good normal comparison. That's what this side should look like. Um, but it's trying to heal uh, in this photo, but it really wasn't healing. So what we ultimately had to do with this bird is we had to actually put a pin. This is a little uh, metal pin that's actually inserted down the center of the bone. And x-rays are always a little funny to look at um, because we're taking a three-dimensional animal and putting it down into two dimensions. So this, these pins look a little funny on the x-ray, but the, this pin here was actually connecting to this pin via this sort of uh, little connecting bar that's actually cut in this photo. Uh, but we had to put the pin down the leg to actually get it to line up appropriately and for her to heal appropriately. So like if we're looking at her leg here, this central rod is down the leg here and then it's kind of coming out. And then this little one right here is actually kind of right down here bar connecting them together so it was stabilizing it and holding it in place um, but you know she it was all initiated by a cage door injury um, and she had to go through sort of a uh, long treatment uh, she she did great in, in the end finally um, but you know 
something that may maybe could have been avoided. Um, oh, and it's kind of cut off a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, the this picture is uh, showing a bird versus a toy. Um, unfortunately, toys, you know, they're meant for birds. Uh, these, we get these bird uh, toys from, from bird stores and everything, but you do have to be just mindful that toys can sometimes cause injuries as well. This photo of this little budgie um, is trying to show underneath the beak here, you'll notice that the feathers are just a little messy. Um, that dark sort of staining on those feathers there, it's actually a little bit of dried blood. This little bird, um, you know the little like latch uh, ring things that um, as ten, essentially like attach the toy to the cage? Um, that little latch piece like had come open and the bird went to play with that for whatever reason and unfortunately it hooked the beak and actually underneath the beak there between the beak and um, the side of the, the neck is a really soft area very delicate skin and actually had punctured through that really soft delicate skin. The bird healed fine um, but you know that the bird came into the hospital with that thing actually uh, stuck around its, its mouth and had to have it removed. So not very comfortable. Um, here's an example of a bird that uh, was playing with something that had a bell in it and, and Perts are really great uh, at getting the little clacker parts out of bells or the little jingly portions out of bells. Um, it seems like it's a goal almost that they have whenever there is something that is uh, making a noise to make it stop making a noise. I don't know. Um, but this bird actually got the little bell part out of um, one of its toys and got it stuck to the, the lower portion of the beak. Um, so had to have that you know, taken off. So even these these toys that we think are, you know, going to be safe, there's always the potential for a problem. Um, to go into bird versus household problems, um, this sad little bird, this is a glue trap. Um, and so owners had a glue trap out for rodents um, and the bird was out flying around and got stuck on the glue trap. So uh, the owners couldn't get her off the glue trap, so she came into the hospital on the glue trap and we had to take her off of it. Um, this is a bird that, uh, you know, sometimes you, you hear certain stories and think, did that really happen? Um, and this I feel like was one of those. Um, this bird was cockatiel flying around in its house the owners were cooking in the kitchen and they had a pot of boiling water and the bird fell in the pot or landed in the pot of boiling water. So this, these are very serious burns. I mean, these are third degree burns on, on this little cockatiel's leg because it fell into the um, pot. And you can see it actually also has a little lesion on its keel. That was actually totally unassociated with the lesions to the legs. So. There was other and that's not something you can treat at home like you need to no okay. yeah i mean it's it's you definitely want to come into the hospital because i mean it's just like you know think about it for yourself like you know would you want to treat third degree bird at, on yourself at home you know no these things are horribly painful um they can cause electrolyte imbalances in your body because there's seepage of uh you know serum and and, and fluids and everything from your body um they're highly prone to secondary infections um so there's a lot of care that needs to go into these sort of injuries so but uh you know something to be aware of is you know if you're cooking keep the bird in its cage is a kind of good rule to have because, you know, sometimes there's a lot of things going on in the kitchen when you're cooking and you can't control all those variables and uh, man, to throw a bird into the, the middle of it, I mean, it's just sometimes I think asking for, for problems. Um, oh, and oh, this photo kind of got a little cut off, unfortunately. Um, maybe you guys can still see it somewhat, hopefully, um, but I put this photo up. This is, I wrote it as, and unfortunately the PowerPoint kind of is a little different on my computer here versus my computer at home. Um, but this is an accident that's waiting to happen. So this is my bookshelf at home. Um, and this is, if you can hopefully see it in the corner here, um, is my Amazon parrot, um, Arroyo, who was here for our last 
uh, talk. He, now what you can't see in the photo is his tree stand was sort of right next to the bookshelf. Um, and he climbed off the tree stand and he went to look at the books. And I took the photo because I thought it was really cute of him looking at all these avian medicine books that I had. Um, but if you think about it, this is an accident that's waiting to happen. Because what's going to happen if he hooks his little beak up on the book? And what if he pulls funny and this book falls off the, the shelf with him. Um, so I took the photo and then I took him off, you know, and said, okay, you can't play over there. Um, so it's, it's, you know, again, just something, be mindful of where accidents could potentially be. Um, even if they seem very innocent, just be cautious. I did have a patient one time who was climbing on like a, a basket and, um, the basket like tipped over on the bird. The bird fell with the basket. The basket fell on the bird and it broke the bird's back. Um, and so that bird is now paralyzed. Um, the owners do a great job of taking care of her, but she can't, she can't walk anymore, you know? So a, a totally freak accident. Um, but you know, if birds are climbing on things that are not secured down, there's the potential that things could fall and we could have some injuries happen. Um, okay, so that's it that I had for photos. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Um, so now, the, again, this is, that was just sort of a uh, highlight of, of a few things to be aware of, but the reality is, is there's lots of different things that could be um, a problem for our birds in our homes. Um, so, you know, uh, what sort of, uh, questions do you have? Oh, okay. Well, I think <laughs> it's also a good reminder to have your vet's number, you know, on the fridge and maybe have some basic, you know, uh, what to do, you know, if your bird gets scalding water or boiling water on just like a really quick, um, list of steps you can take before, you know, on what, before you take them to the vet and stuff. But, um, just to definitely have a, the emergency vet number, you know, available on your fridge, a 24 hour vet number to call, right? Yeah, um, oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. You never know when an accident's gonna happen, so. Exactly, yeah. And it's good to have your regular vet, and as you said, a 24 hour emergency too, because if your regular vet, you know, um, closes at a particular time and isn't 24 hours, you need to have that backup available as well. Okay. So let's see, we do have some questions. Um, so first up um, from Tamia, she asks, can a green sheet conure and a zebra friend finch live peacefully together? Um, you know, it's parrots and passerines together. I'm not gonna say that they can't because I have certainly seen the situation before where they, they can live together and, and be peaceful together. But Parrots and passerines mixing together, I always worry about a bit because, you know, passerines have these, they're, they're called soft bills, you know, is the other name for a passerine. They have a soft bill um, that is uh, meant to not really be causing a lot of harm. They're cracking tiny little seeds. They don't need a lot of power in their jaws versus um, parrots. I mean, they have this hooked bill, you know, that's the other name for or, uh, the citizens is hook bills, right? Um, and they have much stronger jaw muscles um, than our little passerines do. And so uh, a hook bill and a soft bill mixed together, um, if there is a situation where that soft bill cannot get away, the hook bill is going to be the winner. Um, so I would be, I would be highly cautious of it. Um, I, again, I have seen it where it has been okay, but the birds are usually flighted. I've never seen it in a situation where the birds aren't flighted because they need to absolutely be able to get away. I've also never seen it be uh, okay in anything bigger than a flight cage. Like they have to be able to fly away, have their own areas, um, and be able to be, be safe at different distances. Because if we're talking about a standard, like smaller size cage that the birds can't fly around and if, and if they're clipped, oh man, that's a, a definite accident waiting to happen. So. Okay. Um, and Luana, Luana asks, uh, my adult son and his wife insist on taking my Nanday Conure everywhere, like restaurants, malls, etc. 
The bird is always on their shoulder. I absolutely maintain this is not safe and we have reached an impasse. So what advice can you offer her? Um, regarding okay, that? so what I would say is if, you know, it's, it's fun to take your bird somewhere. So I see their, their uh, desire to get their bird out into the world and have a lot of fun with them. Um, but if they're gonna take the bird out, that bird I think needs to be, if they're keeping it on their shoulder and it's not in a cage that they're carrying it around in, that bird should probably be harness trained. I don't know if it is or not, but I would highly, highly, highly recommend being, having that bird be harness trained. Because although a bird may sit on your shoulder and be comfortable and be okay with a lot of situations, there's a lot of unpredictable situations that can happen. Loud noises, um, some something coming past the bird that may look not scary to us, but be very scary to a bird, um, you know, to where it might want to suddenly fly off of a shoulder. And even if that bird's clipped, you never know where that bird's going to land. Is that bird going to fly off a shoulder and land in a safe spot? Or is that bird going to fly off a shoulder and land in a dog's mouth? And I will tell you, I have seen that happen before that a bird was, that uh, hung out on people's shoulders a lot was carried around in different locations and um, the owner like went to reach for something and whatever that thing was that they were reaching for like the bird got scared by it bird took off there happened to be a dog in the right spot and the dog just grabbed it um, so you know and and that bird died um, so you know, <laughs> if, if they're gonna do it, the safest way to do it is have a harness because if that bird's on a harness and it's, it's more secure and safe, if it does feel like it needs to fly away, then it may only be able to go just a foot or two uh, right next to you and be able to come right back up on the shoulder. So that would be my advice. <laughs> okay, yeah, sounds good. Um, and then uh, Jane had a question. This is actually an interesting one. Um, do, do birds attack each other in the wild? Um, uh, at this point in the wild. Yeah, do they do? You, yeah, do I mean, they, yeah, they, they, they certainly can and do. Uh, it does depend on what's going on. Um, you know, sometimes hormones may be playing a role. Usually, they, if they attack one another, there is some sort of resource that they are guarding um, that causes them to attack one another. Now, if you look at birds like that are on clay licks, where you have multiple different like macaws and Amazons flying over and, and uh, foraging on a clay lick, if, if you watch them, uh, there sometimes will be like little minor, like uh, minor like uh, bickering that happens. But usually if there is that minor bickering, then one is gonna fly away. So it'll back off and take off and come over to another location. So they're, they're, they can get into little fights uh, that don't really cause anything. And they may be, there may be a lot of um, like warning things that birds do beforehand. Oh, well, there are a lot of warning things that birds do beforehand that birds are really good at picking up on one another's uh, body language and understanding like, oh, you're pinning your eyes at me. You're fluffing your head up. Maybe I need to back up right now, you know? Um, so yes, they do get into fights. Yes, injuries happen in the wild, um, but a lot of times they are good at conveying to one another um, with their body language, sometimes before an, an injury really happens. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. And then Mary asks, um, are there concerns with aquariums and bacteria in the air? Oh, bacteria in the air, like in the room. Ooh. Um, hmm. I, I don't know that that's necessarily a problem. Um, I mean, there are bacteria in the water of an aquarium, and that's actually part of what makes an aquarium, you have to have some bacteria in there in order to have a healthy aquarium. Um, but that's a totally different species. Um, but as far as that, like increasing the bacteria in the air, I don't think so. Um, I could see how potentially it could increase your moisture, your humidity in the area if it's in a small room, and maybe then that um, would potentially affect like that humidity effect maybe having some effect on bacteria or mold growing elsewhere. But I wouldn't necessarily say that it would be in the air itself, but I, I don't have a great answer for that question with confirmed uh, scientific data for you. Okay. Um, and then Tina asks, uh, did the gray who was attacked, um, the one you showed earlier, um, that began the self, begin the self mutilating behaviors or did it already have feather destructive behavior? Um, that bird actually started the feather destructive behavior after the attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was kind of a traumatizing experience, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, let's see if we have any more. Uh, oh, by the way, going back to the aquariums, um, I know that uh, some, some people recommend those. Uh, they're kind of good to keep your bird occupied during the day by watching the fish go back and forth. So kind of, yeah. you know, like kind of a, a boredom buster there. Uh, yeah, you, I mean, my finch jumped right in. He thought it was a great swimming pool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's like a, as, a, as a swimming pool is not per se. Yeah, no, I was like, oh, no, I'm, we can't do that. That is not okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness, yes. Okay, and then Vicki asks, uh, I have a female Quaker, age five. She's chewing on all sorts of things now, and this is new. Is this a seasonal thing? Uh, she's five. You said she's five years old? Yes. Is it a seasonal thing? Um... Well, I guess it kind of depends on, it has the potential to be because is it, is the chewing behavior associated with maybe a hormonal thing, potentially. Um, and, and that's going to depend upon a lot of your environmental cues. Um, so it's, you know, fall um, now. So if she is uh, starting to see that the daylight is becoming less, you know, it's getting darker earlier, you know, that it may not be a hormonal thing, but it just really depends because birds in our homes can be hormonal all the time um, if they want to be because we provide them these unnatural light cycles and all this stuff that we had talked about before um, in a few lectures past. So po potentially, yeah, it potentially could be a, a seasonal thing because it could potentially be hormonal, but if it's hormonal, it could potentially turn into a long-term thing. Okay. Uh, and then we have for a question from Zeke. asks, my one and a half year old cockatiel freaks out for unknown reasons and flies into walls and windows. Nothing serious has happened yet. What can I do? So it, it sounds like a easily a startled teal. Is it? Easily startled bird. Um, well, you know, there's something that's making him be startled. And the question is, is what? is it? If we could figure out what the underlying thing was that was making him be startled, that would be a good place to start, you know, um, and you could work on things like counter conditioning, um, uh, desensitization, that sort of stuff um, that's really well discussed in, in behavioral um, circles. Um, but if it's hard to identify what the, the reason is for him being scared all of a sudden and you can't like identify, um, then, you know, the it, it might it might be good to consider temporarily clipping his wings, uh, making him not be able to fly uh, for a little bit, and and having positive interactions with him, rewarding him for coming out and be sitting in areas and being calm and, and quiet. And then maybe you know when he molts and he has his new wings come in, maybe he'll be a little bit more of a calm bird. But but it is good sometimes if if he if they are really nervous and trying to figure out what that thing is that's making them be nervous is keeping a little bit of a journal sometimes a little diary like oh he, he just freaked out what happened you know a minute ago you know did somebody just walk into the room was there some noise that happened outside was there a light that turned on um did the dog walk past did a car go by the window you know trying to think back just a, a minute or two before the incident occurred and keeping a little diary of those things because yeah maybe a car did go by but maybe it's not the car that went by you know outside uh you know and just keeping a, a journal so that you can maybe identify after a few events, like, oh, look, every single time it's happened, this particular thing has occurred. Maybe that's what's scaring him. And then going back and working on that. Okay. Um, and then I think this is probably our last question for today. Um, what sh uh, from Amir, what should I do if my bird is injured when the vet's office is closed? So after hours, what do we do? Yeah. So first off, best thing is having a, um, a uh, 24 hour facility that you can reach out to. So most, and, and I think it's a law actually in most states that veterinary hospitals have to have some, somewhere that they can refer people to. I know it's at least a law in, in Arizona um, that like we have to tell people like if we're not open, you know, here's the places you can contact for emergency services after hours, that sort of stuff. Um, so that's number one is identifying a emergency facility backup. Even if it's an hour away, it's still better than nothing. Um, then the other thing is sometimes having sort of a, a, a first aid kit at home. Um, and maybe that's something we could talk about uh, in more detail at uh, another um, talk because sometimes having a little kit and knowing what things to have in that kit can be really helpful uh, for people to know what things are safe to use if you can't get a vet on the phone and you need to do something right away. So, 
Okay. And, and just there, here's some cautionary tales that people have shared with us just to keep these in mind. I'll read them out um, real quick. So someone said, uh, Jade mentions that the toilet uh, is a dangerous place for potential drowning. So uh, remember to keep the lid down on your toilets, uh, you know, if your bird has access to your bathroom. Um, and here's a, sh here's a story from Laura. She says, our pet sitters accidentally killed our beloved mus uh, mu mustache parakeet when we were out on vacation. They brought a scented candle into our home mm -hmm. thinking that they could mask a bad sit um, smell. Well, and, and um, yeah, sorry. I was gonna say that's a very good point that I didn't, yeah really bring up of the the a whole other area of discussion of um the toxins in the air that can be a problem so yeah since uh, mary point, points out that fires and smoke um uh air purifiers must have um avoid the ionizers i've heard that before right with the air purifiers to be careful yeah um oh <laughs> So, uh, so, so, Dr. Ste Dr. Stephanie Lamb, that's the Dr. Lamb, they asked what your last name was. And then it, what's the name of your clinic, um, Dr. Lamb? Uh, Arizona Exotic Animal Hospital. Okay. There you go. Um, so, uh, oh, okay. And then um, there is a, an excellent article on lafever.com by Lisa Bono under the avian um, expert articles about air purifiers. So, um, you can check that out on uh, lafever.com. Um, I think we are, well, this is definitely a topic that's popular and I think we could, you know, there's a lot more to explore with, um, you know, hazards and stuff. So hopefully we can yeah. address some more of this in the future. Um, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, that, that was very informative. Thank you. Uh, it's a very important topic. So we want to keep our birds safe whenever. Yeah. Possible. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, next Friday, we will be on again with uh, Dr. Tom Tolley. So we'll have um, Ask the Vet for Do uh, with Dr. Tom Tolley next Friday. And um, Dr. Lamb, thank you. Uh, thank you again um, yeah. for sharing and all the, the photos and, and all the, the insight that you have on keeping our birds safe. And hopefully we'll see you back soon. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone. Be, uh, all the best to you and your flock and, and be safe. Bye. Bye.